Hello, hello. It's the Japan Zoomina at UC San Diego. It's January 10th, 2023 in San Diego. That makes it January 11th in Japan. Akemashite omedito gozaimasu. Happy New Year. I'm Ori Kashida, Professor of Japanese Business at UC San Diego and the Director of JFIT, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology. While you good Zoom participants are still finding your seats, let me tell you a little bit about our school before I introduce our speaker today. Uh, you, this finds you at the School of Global Policy and Strategy, GPS. GPS is an international relations and public policy school. We offer seven degrees, one of which is a Master's of International Affairs with a Japan specialization. More info on all of that is at gps.ucsd.edu. And JFIT is our Japan Center, and so we try to um, enlighten and connect Japan and San Diego. Um, and so our website is jfit.ucsd.edu. If you go to that website, you find a bunch of tabs. One is News and Media, where you can sign up uh, for our JFIT San Diego Japan Newsflash, a bi-weekly thing where we try to have some uh, fun and bring, in, bring together uh, uh, the uh, the off the beaten track Japan news and San Diego news, um, and uh, right next to it is the Japan Zoominars tab, where you can find not only registration pages for upcoming events but also uh, our Jay Z Gallery, where you can look at past events. That's right, our Zoominars are recorded, so uh, you can find past recordings there. Uh, what that means is that today, when uh, we ask you to type questions into the Q&A box, I will refer to you only by your first name to ensure that your privacy is protected. Uh, there's also a support page, and I'm only showing this today to uh, allow me to have an opportunity to thank all of you good listeners who have donated to JFIT this last year and have enabled us to continue the Japan Zoomina series. If you wanted to do it and forgot about it, knock yourselves out, thank you. Uh, every single penny helps and I'm really, really appreciative to all of you who have helped us this past year. All right, so today we have Mike Offen with whom I'm going to introduce momentarily, but before I do so, uh, let me point out that we have in two weeks from now, Yves Tibergen from the University of British Columbia, and he's going to talk about how the pandemic is shaping politics in East Asia. So an update on Japan and China and so forth and so on. So uh, it's always uh, Tuesdays at 4 p.m. in California, which currently means it's Wednesdays at 9 a.m. in Japan. Uh, so this is our Jay-Z gallery. This is what it looks like when you go there. Uh, let me just go forward here because I'm wasting way too much time. But I wanted to point this out. Uh, I had Steph Haggard here uh, uh, before we ended 2022. And this is, of course, the uh, announcement of the kanji of the year for 2022, which is difficult to read. But uh, it looks like this in the textbook. And it is, as many of you now realize, sen. And I looked it up. Sen means battle, struggle fight, conflict, all of that bad stuff. Uh, and I thought I'd bring it up again because uh, business in Asia might also find itself in battle, in particular in Japan. There's a lot of uncertainty around exchange rates, the future of inflation, uh, open innovation, how to move forward. And so with that, let me stop and introduce Michael Offland. Here he is. Hey, Mike. Uh, thank hey. you and good morning in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. um, so, so let me introduce you, Mike. Um, the the audience that is here today, of course, has seen your bio on the registration page, but the the recording may not have that. So let me uh, go a little bit into this. So, Mike Offland is the group chairman and CEO of Fusion Systems Group, a multinational fintech firm focused on providing business technologies and systems across Asia. So Mike uh, often sits on an airplane and flies around Asia, which will be one of the topics we're gonna to talk about today. Uh, Mike started Fusion Systems in 1992, um, sold it off, and I understand you got it back and relaunched it as a FinTech firm a little bit later in 2005. Uh, but altogether, Mike has founded 20 technology companies in a matter of 30 years. So he's a bona fide serial entrepreneur and uh, and we wanna hear all about that today. Um, his companies are located in Japan, China, Hong Kong, Australia, the US, and there are multiple, multiple uh, successful exits. And Mike has used some of these exits to help and support um, Japan related research in the United States. Thank you for that, Mike. 
Um, he's also um, obviously uh, a high energy person. Uh, the former chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce in Japan, ACCJ, um, that he presided over between 2011 and 2013, which of course was the time of the Fukushima disaster. And Mike was uh, at the helm of the Tomodachi uh, Initiative, which is one of these examples of real friendship in the US-Japan alliance. When your friends are in trouble, we come to help. So thank you, Mike, that was, that was terrific. Uh, you got actually the Peace Through Commerce Medal from the U.S. government for that. that that's uh, well-deserved. In addition, Mike has also been the president of the Tokyo American Club. This is a more recent, um, which he then led through the uh, COVID pandemic um, that, that began, of course, in 2020. So, um, and in addition to all of that, you have uh, uh, your volunteer, uh, the board member of Hope Japan, and uh, as a guest lecturer at various Japanese universities, and you serves on, and Mike serves on multiple boards. So, with that, here you are. Welcome, Mike. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Ulrike. Thank you very much. And and I want to thank everyone who's tuned in today. I really appreciate that they're taking their time uh, to listen to us. So I'll do my best to make it entertaining and uh, informative. And, I really do appreciate you asking me to kick off 2023 for this great series. Uh, it, it's just a wonderful initiative that you've come up with. And uh, it's a high bar. Some of the past speakers have been fantastic. So I, I fortified myself with multiple cups of coffee. I'm ready to rock uh, and, and we'll get right into it. I do want to make sure, you know, I'm not a lecturer. I, I want this to be as interactive as possible. So uh, my understanding is that you will moderate any questions that come in, and I want to encourage everyone who's tuned in to uh, put their questions into the question box or chat box, and uh, Ulrike will take a look at them, and if, if they're deemed worthy, uh, she will reiterate them in her own inimitable style, and I'll do my best to come back with something meaningful. Uh, and the way I wanted to kick things off today was really to key in on a few of the points that the professor made uh, in her introduction, which is from one perspective, this is a time of great uncertainty, specifically for Japan. Uh, there are some very unusual geopolitical forces, uh, whether they be uh, national forces or economic forces uh, in terms of inflation and interest rates. Uh, business forces in terms of uh, logistics and supply chain, uh, and just general uncertainty uh, onshore here in Japan, obviously pandemics and wars and other things going on. And so I, I feel that the natural reaction to that level of uncertainty is to kind of dig a hole and jump into it and then <laughs> cover it up uh, with a little, little lid and just wait out the uncertainty until things look better. But my thesis is that this is a great time for venture investing and entrepreneurship in Japan. I think uncertainty actually presents enormous opportunities for startups and SMEs if looked at correctly. And, and one of the things about entrepreneurs is we're all uh, optimistic all the time, whether it's warranted or not. And so <laughs> I tend to be very, very positive and look at ways to turn uh, events and geopolitical uncertainty into opportunities. Uh, so in fact, while we were teeing up this conversation, Ulrike and I were on the uh, chat about 15 minutes ago and came up with a good business idea uh, that we, <laughs> we might take to market, we'll say. Uh, have to do some software development and see how viable it is. Uh, but I think that's the kind of thing that I'm very interested in discussing today. Uh, and that's kind of, uh, uh, those topics are what I hope elicit questions from everyone tuning in. So can I turn it back over to you, Ulrike, and uh, let you guide me through the conversation? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I mean, so this, the, let's stay with that theme of, uh, you know, one person's threat is another person's opportunity. Yeah. And that's, of course, um, the motto of Silicon Valley, where there is this always an optimism. I can do something in this moment, right? And if there is a if there is a dilemma, I can solve it. And if there's if there's some industry suffering, I can help it 
uh, if there is uh, something not working, I can fix it. We don't see this attitude in Japan in the same way, do we? Yeah, it's interesting, and you're right. Um, it's not clear to me we see it anywhere really outside of uh, the United States and a few other countries, maybe Israel and uh, to a lesser extent Finland and, and maybe a few other isolated places. You know, I think the issue here, Ulrike, is that Japan's kind of stuck in, in a bit of a time warp. Um, large Japanese firms outside of financial services have not grown materially in the last 30 years. They're essentially flat in terms of revenue. Uh, and so that, I don't know if that's a symptom or a, a driver of this sort of malaise that you're describing. Uh, but what I can tell you in my world, in information technology, there is a well-acknowledged problem in Japan, which is that a disproportionate amount of IT spend is going towards maintenance of legacy systems, as opposed to innovating and driving top line. And it's, it's frustrating for certain, uh, and what's more frustrating from a Japanese societal and policy point of view is that when they do manage to uh, hatch a aggressive, young, uh, vibrant entrepreneur, many of them end up leaving Japan after a few years and depriving Japan of the benefit of their vision and wisdom and drive and energy. And so to me, that, that's a real structural issue that needs to get addressed. Uh, you know, the flip side, again, looking at everything positively is that means there's more room for guys like me <laughs> uh, to do things and try to start businesses and make money and create communities and uh, generally make myself useful. Uh, and so there's two sides to that. But th there is definitely a situation here where out outside of financial services, large Japanese companies have basically been stagnant for 30 years. There are a few exceptions. You know, you get your Rakuten's and Takeda's and SoftBank's and whoever else. But the large Japanese industrials essentially have not grown top line revenue uh, for a long, long time. Yeah, I wonder whether the same would be true for for the U.S. It's a sample issue, right? So yeah. if we were to look at Sears and Bed Bath and Beyond, all these retailers that are no longer exist, right? If we look at yeah. um, Whirlpool, Maytag, you know, the old brands of the 1980s, yeah, we would probably find that they have stagnated as well. And so I'm wondering whether sometimes it's a lens thing where we're looking at the old household names, whether that's, you know, Toshiba or something like that, sure. rather than looking at these new drivers of economic mm. growth that were that didn't exist in the 1980s or were so small that we, you know, we never noticed them. So I'm mm. thinking about chemical companies like JSR or, or Shoba yeah. Denko or, you know, that or Shinetsu chemical yeah. and things like that, where there is no real comparison because we didn't look at them then, nobody knows their names. So they fall out of the out of the sample. And all that we're bemoaning is the decline of the old guys. But every, I mean, I could give you the same list for Germany. I could give you the list here of companies that should be here, and I mean, including Blockbuster, that should be here and aren't. Right. Mm. right. So, so, but, but it's true. Right? It's it's true that the, the the obviously the macroeconomic data bear this out that that there has been a lot of stagnation. Although um, uh, Japan, there are there are, Japan is only the eleventh largest country in the world. It's the third largest economy. So something is working, right? So that's kind of my story. So uh, actually, questions are coming in. So David uh, is wondering. Uh, so yes, Japan is often seen as a follower, not a leader, but can you offer some examples where Japan is actually leading yeah. regionally or globally in IT and other areas? Yeah, yeah. Let me just say two quick things in response to, to what you said. You bringing up all those old brands made me hear all the jingles from the commercials of when I was a kid uh, in my head. So I'm thinking of Maytag repairmen and, and other things. Uh, but the I, I think one thing to understand is that those brands and those companies in the US eventually do disappear. In Japan, you've still got those legacy companies lingering on 
uh, and they won't go away. So back when we were studying this, um, we talked about metabolism, economic metabolism. It's, it's just, a, it creates a low metabolic rate here where we can't repurpose those resources and uh, that energy into some newer things. But to your question, sure. Uh, Japan's doing a lot of very interesting things right now with regenerative medicine, for example. And so, as we know, Yamanaka Sensei won the Nobel Prize for, for his stem cell innovations. And that's created a pretty, pretty vibrant biotech, um, regenerative medicine startup culture. Uh, Tokyo, Kyoto, Fukuoka, there, there were sort of nodes out there where some very smart, uh, very aggressive young Japanese MD, PhDs are digging in and getting some interesting stuff done. Uh, I think if you go out uh, and talk to some of the leading Japanese researchers in uh, quantum, quantum computing, uh, there's some very interesting, innovative stuff being there. Um, I forget the professor's name, the guy who runs quantum over at IBM in Hakozaki, uh, wrote the book on, uh, what was it, either Java or um, Ruby programming using quantum computers. So he built some compiler or some, uh, some way to adapt relatively easy to use languages to run on quantum machines that IBM has. Uh, I think you're seeing a lot of interesting innovation around fintech here that's starting to come up. Uh, some smart young people. Japan didn't get quite as caught up in the crypto world as some other countries. There's, there's a bit of it here, but I think generally uh, there's a lot of attention being paid to that space right now. So, you know, the, the issue I've always felt is that Japanese policymakers conflate innovation and entrepreneurship. That to them, it's one thing. Right. And as many times as I've sat down and, and said, look, let's level set. Innovation is the creation of new technologies and or new business models. Entrepreneurship is the commercialization of innovation. And those are different. So to me, Japan is actually pretty innovative. There's a lot of good innovation going on here. Entrepreneurship may be a little less so. And one of the interesting dynamics is across the water here, our friends in China are very entrepreneurial, maybe not quite as innovative. And so it always occurred to me that, you know, the U.S., we, the secret sauce we have is we're both innovative and entrepreneurial, and we're big. So of the major economies, we're really the only ones that, that have that, and that's the Silicon Valley magic or the um, uh, Austin, Texas, or, or um, the, the entrepreneur cluster in New York, et cetera, that combination of innovation and entrepreneurship. To me, the natural partners in Asia are really Japan and China where it's a combination of Japanese innovation and Chinese entrepreneurship. Uh, but there are certain cultural issues uh, and, and historical issues that maybe stand in the way of that. But that, that's how I would answer that question. I think Japan's very innovative. Uh, there are a lot of really smart people here. Uh, and there's the whole um, artisanal aspect to Japanese culture where people get narrow and deep. <laughs> the takumi, and, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, and, and monotsukuri and, and all of that good stuff. Uh, I think the issue comes in when we start talking about commercializing some of that innovation here. And there are a lot of downstream issues and a lot of root cause analyses we can talk about. But that, that's how I would respond to that question from David. Yeah, and Daniel footnotes it and says robotics is probably also an area. Robotics, which I'm yes, thank you. I would, I would add to that. So my research always leads me back to find chemicals. Yeah, okay. So the input, the upstream input materials that are needed to make yeah. semiconductors and so forth. And that's that's a very difficult area. Yeah. And Japan has an advantage and is not sitting still, right? So there's a lot of, um, you know, it's a real, lot of activity there. Let, let's Absolutely. stay with the large farms for a little bit before we go to the small guys. Sure. Um, I mean, so... At, at one level, innovation 
I mean, it's much easier for large firms to be innovative, right? So large firms have everything that a startup company needs. They have money, they have the talent, they have the assets, they have an R&D lab, they have everything, right? So, so it should actually be anywhere, not just Japan, it should actually be the case that the large firms are more innovative. And maybe that's also a key to this issue, right? That that mm. that maybe this lifetime employment system has made them so ossified that it's so difficult to be entrepreneurial in a large company. Yeah, yeah. If I focus on large Japanese companies, I think one of the issues that these companies are facing right now is the competition for global talent. So to innovate, you need some really clever uh, orthogonal thinking. It, it can't be conformist straight line thinking. And those people exist here, they exist everywhere. However, over the last few years, the market for those people's skills has become global. And the interest rates have moved against Japan. So onboarding that global talent has become very expensive in Japan, there's been wage inflation and exchange rate movement. And so for a large company to think about how do I build critical mass for say a lab or innovating around some technology or some IP we own, attracting that global talent is very, very difficult in Japan. Um, you know, large Japanese companies sometimes have the expectation or the criteria for new hires that they speak Japanese. Um, you know, there are 127 million people on this island. Uh, globally, there are probably 130 million Japanese speakers. So you're not choosing from a really big pool if you're going to limit yourself in that regard. And I think where smaller companies actually have an advantage in this case. So if I look at my companies and what I do, I might look at somebody really clever from your university and said, boy, I'd love to have her on my team. I just can't afford her. It's too expensive. Uh, but what I can do is maybe buy 10 hours a week of her time. That might work. And I can build an innovation practice or a, a technology development practice around available resources, fractional resources, because I don't have the large company business process constraints that may exist in some of my competitors. I'm not really encumbered by compliance and HR and existing staff and seniority and all these other things. And so it's, it becomes very, very difficult for some of the large Japanese companies to actually access and deploy global talent in a way that drives innovation. Whereas I think some of us, some of the smaller entrepreneurs, I'll build my whole business process and business around access to talent. So I'll, I'll sort of flip it on its head and accommodate the talent instead of trying to shove the talent into my existing right. square hole. And I think that that's one of the things I see when I speak to some large Japanese firms who are all look, they, they all understand, um, you know, they, they're very uh, analytical and they get it. It's just, it becomes almost untenable for them to fit that square peg into the round hole without breaking a lot of other stuff uh, that frankly pays the bills for them already. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like changing the gears on a locomotive that's already in, in motion. It's doable, but you, you got to be pretty careful about how you do it. And you probably don't want to rush into it. Uh, and so I think, what I usually advise large Japanese companies is you need to really partner with some of the smaller venture companies in a way that the venture company finds productive, not in a way that you find productive. And that's a difficult thing. I think historically, uh, business in, in Japan is all about getting big fast and then walling off your space so that no one else can get in there. Uh, and so it's, it's, there are some cultural issues, but you know you do have some large Japanese companies that are doing very interesting, innovative things um, that are creating labs overseas or innovation centers overseas. 
uh, in looking at both applied research and general research as a way to drive their business. Um, I think what I would encourage large Japanese companies to do is look at innovation as a way of driving top line numbers, not as a way of saving money. And so sometimes Japanese companies tend to look at innovation as a way to increase efficiencies and cut costs without cutting headcount. And that that's maybe not exactly the right approach uh, to create an, a culture around innovation. You know, with yeah, I mean, the upside of this, you know, as, uh, as you know, I've been thinking about this a little bit. I mean, the upside is that, you know, the, the fact that there's a reputational cost for, you know, laying people off and hiring new people or shrinking the workforce or doing this thing, there's a huge reputation cost, right? Because then next round, you will not have access to talent. So you can't lay people off. If you don't lay people off, then you have this problem that you just described. On the positive side, it makes Japan, you know, a great place that has, you know, a solid middle class and yeah. stable and safe and clean and all of these wonderful things that that actually are, can be very attractive. Right? And so how to have both is a, is a big thing. I, I don't think Japanese society would ever be willing to accept the slash and burn of Silicon Valley okay. and, and all okay. the... And all the failures and all the money lost and, and all the, you know, un, unproductive um, duplication, dupl duplicative efforts of inventing something. I, I just don't think that Japanese society has a taste for that. Yeah, right? I, so, I agree. I agree. And two things really come to mind from you saying that is, number one, and most importantly, we should never forget as foreigners is Japanese people like Japan the way it is. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I, I like really it too, important. right? So, yes. I mean, what's not to I've like? I've been here for 32 years, so <laughs> I obviously <laughs> like it as well. Um, the other thing, you hit the magic word, which you said stable. And I think in Japanese culture, Japanese business, Japanese society, stability and the perception of stability is very highly valued. So to some extent, if we're going into the Silicon Valley world, stability is is a negative so if you're not failing you're not trying and all of those great things that come out of peter thiel's book and all the accepted wisdom in silicon valley i get that but japan not like that and so it is a tightrope there there's a very uh, delicate balance that large japanese companies need to navigate they really need to thread the needle on some of this as you said the good thing is they've got the resources there's a lot of retained earnings here, <laughs> a lot of assets that are generating essentially no return on capital. And so I, I think a gradual repurposing of some of those uh, might be warranted over the next few years. And I think I think it's already happening. And some of it is uh, outward bound M&A, which is yeah. growing in leaps and bounds. Uh, yeah. some, of it, some of this is new market for private equity investments. And yep. so it's it's happening, but you know, it's, it's slow. Slow is not stagnant, right? Slow is good, stagnant is bad. Um, from an American perspective, it often is a little bit disappointing. I mean, it's easy to grow impatient with, with Japan. Right. Why, right. why so, not, why can this not happen, right? Why is yeah. this? I mean, look, we all know, I mean, you run a program, we've all been to business school or whatever else. You are trained and rewarded for controlled aggression. In American business. Right. And so sometimes what I tell people, having done business in America, China, and Japan for 40 plus years, actually America and China are much more alike than people yeah. might think. And so to me, when I'm doing business in the US or China, in my mind, the analogy is a boxing match. So the bell rings and you've got to be giving it 110% or someone's gonna punch you in the nose and knock you on the ground. Japan, in my mind, is more like running a marathon. You just gotta keep putting one foot in front of the other, not thinking about the finish line, not thinking about all the people around you, just keep moving at your pace. Steady, steady does it. Keep moving, right. Yeah. Uh, and so I think on the, on the global stage, Japan is the real outlier in many, many ways, almost in every way for, for large countries. Uh, and it does take a certain accommodation and a certain mindset 
I think, to be successful here. And, and I really do appreciate that large Japanese companies, they understand that they have a societal obligation as well as a shareholder obligation. Uh, and they do take that seriously, having sat in board meetings and having sat in strategy sessions at large Japanese companies, they, they do take that seriously. And that's one of the things that makes it a very nice place to be. Right. But then when it's slow, too slow, and yeah. and and this inability to price aggressively, right? So yeah. um, the pricing, you talked about entrepreneurship uh, being difficult in Japan. And I think it has something to do with, so the innovation side, there's no reason why Japan should be less innovative than any other place. And it isn't, right? There's a Great. lot of innovation. And there are now these startups that are coming out of the universities and mm. there are pockets of innovation everywhere. But to make money out of it, uh, is 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 a whole different thing, and designing a new business model, and and why that is so difficult is it? Yeah, you know, Ulrike. I mean, there's this is someone can do a PhD on this, yes. um, but what I would say at a high level is Japanese business people are not taught how to value risk. And so, from a young age, I think in the West, we're taught to accept a certain level of risk and through trial and error, assign a value to price that risk. And then we come up with a, an acceptable level of risk for ourselves, our family, our business, whatever situation we're in. I think the, the uh, upbringing of many Japanese, the school system here teaches people to avoid risk. And so the avoidance of risk from a young age going forward really predicates against proper pricing and valuing of risk later on. And that's what hurts, I think, some of the, the entrepreneurial ventures here. Um, as people who have made pitches to Japanese VCs, you know, sometimes I'll tell the story where you go in there and you make your pitch and they say, you know, that sounds really risky. <laughs> and you're thinking, yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> that was the idea. Um, and so it's very interesting to have done pitches in, in the U.S. and Japan, where in the U.S. there's this constant refrain of, I don't think you're taking enough risk. Double down, do more. Whereas in Japan, there's this, how, how do we reduce the risk? And you know, there are different kinds of entrepreneurship. You know, I think we talked about this a, a little while ago. 97% of the people who are employed in Japan work for small companies. So there's a very vibrant small company environment here. There's tons of stuff going on. You go down any shopping street and there's a fellow or a lady who decided, hey, I'm going to start a, um, a business. You know, maybe it's a tatami manufacturing or a fruit stand or, or a pet shop, whatever it is. They've done it. And so they've taken on that risk. It's in there somewhere. It's in the culture somewhere. It's just allowing it to come to the surface that I think we have a bit of a challenge with. Yeah, right so now. that's a great segue to a cluster of questions that, that we have about what the government can do or is doing mm -hmm. or is not doing. Um, so, uh, and, and then we'll go abroad because these questions also go a little bit farther. Sure. Um, so um, the government has been working on this for more than 20 years. I remember when I first started looking at venture capital in Japan, METI had developed a textbook for high school students on how to assess risk. Yeah. And it was about investments and making risk cutoffs. And, uh, tr and this is a long time ago. There was still the old Mombusho. And the Mombusho disallowed it because the Mombusho is in charge of textbooks. And so we can't teach our children on this. <laughs> um, and and I still have it. It's It's quite... Nicely done, actually, uh, and and so and and so for for decades the government has been working on this matter, right? Um, and then came policies with the one yen company and make it easier mm -hmm. to start one. And then came uh, the university reforms to make it easier for professors to start something. Then came some other measures on, you know, so forth and so on. Prime Minister Kishida has just announced a new uh, tax thing. This is actually Rick's question, so maybe look at, we'll go to that, and that'll, that'll get us into the. Uh, so there's a there's a it's a little bit of a finance jargon, but um, there's an uh, the Kishida administration has a, an exemption of capital gains tax for those 
who invest in small firms. So basically you invest in a small company, you make a ton of money, you don't have to pay taxes on it. Yeah. Right. Um, Rick's concerned that that's too little because it doesn't apply to angel funds or pooled investments. And so he would like to hear your opinion on um, whether that's going to, whether that side of, whether the finance route is the route to go to spur more of the small firm entrepreneurship. Okay. Generally speaking, I think the best thing government can do to help entrepreneurs is get out of the way. So, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I mean, that, that sounds flippant and I apologize for that, but kind of the more programs and the more initiatives and the more money that gets spent, um, the fewer the results I seem to see. And that's not just for Japan, that, that's kind of everywhere. So I think to Rick's question, look, that program won't hurt. I don't think it'll move the needle. Um, there'll be some people who take advantage of it and some who don't. I think the government is looking at it the wrong way. So entrepreneurs follow opportunity. Right? And so you've got to create the opportunity if you want entrepreneurship to flourish and to generate new entrepreneurs. To me, the real issue here, if I was going to ask for one government initiative, well, two, I'll ask for two. Number one would be something equivalent to what we have in the U.S., where, where it's um, small business administration, where a certain amount of government procurement is allocated to small business who are qualified, blah, blah, blah. There, there's some very the SBIR elaborate. SBIR and the SBIC, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't think it needs to be a lot of money, mm -hmm. but I do think it needs to be setting a standard directionally so that companies look at their ESG and working with venture companies becomes part of their ESG, for example. Right? To me, that's something the government can do. The second thing they can do is something, it, the issue here for development of, of small businesses is cash flow. It's not exits. Right? It's, and there's plenty of capital. Nobody's worried really about there being enough capital here. You know, Japanese banks are a great source of capital. There's plenty of cash floating around on this island. Capital is not the issue, right? The issue is cash flow. And one of the things that really hurts small businesses here is the protracted sales cycle compared to the US or Europe or even China. And, and the inability to price aggressively. Agree, it's because of this cash flow issue, or at least partially, because it's cash flow. So if I were in charge of the government <laughs> for a day or for a minute, one of the things I would do is come up with some mechanism whereby for any qualified business, I don't know, if you employ three or more people, um, the first 100 million yen this business earns in its life is tax-free. So just give the business that... Um, ability to generate that first chunk of cash so it has a little bit of discretion in terms of taking risks growing hiring reinvesting etc but you know if the government is taking 50 if they're your partner in the business and their partnership interest essentially is you give us 50 percent of the cash flow in terms of taxes that makes it very very difficult for the kind of bootstrap entrepreneurship that really is what generates large scale entrepreneurial successes. You know, everyone wants Tesla and eBay and micro, those are great stories. Those are wonderful success stories in the US, Google and everything else. But that's kind of like, you know, looking at the NBA and saying, yeah, I want to be Michael Jordan. It's like, no, I'll be content to be the guy who sits on the bench but at least I get to wear the uniform and once in a while I get into a game that, that's still pretty darn good. And I think the problem is aspirationally, a lot of these government policies seem to be geared around. We want to clone Michael Jordan. We want an army of Michael Jordans out there, but really that's not, that's not going to happen. <laughs> what you really want to do, I think is create some mechanism where aggressive, talented, ambitious young people, have the time and 
runway to develop their entrepreneurial talents, uh, judgment, uh, decision making, uh, create the charismatic persona that they need without worrying about, hey, I finally made a profit, but half of it's going to the government, so I can't reinvest it in the business. So that's how I would answer Rick's Rick's query is those two things is, is the government needs to step up and show large companies how it's done in terms of procurement from small companies, even on a small scale, just, you know, set the, set the tone there, tone at the top. And then secondly, let, let's figure out some way to let small companies, venture companies retain more of their cash so they can plow it back into the business without a lot of paperwork and forms and applications to various agencies and, and ministries, et cetera. They're just a very simple program. That, that's what I would do. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It reminds me of uh, Rakuten. I'm, I'm a big fan of Rakuten. What's and all? I mean, there's no great company on earth, right? And so Rakuten has its mistakes. But the original business model, because Miki Tanisan paid attention in the MBA program, mm. the original business model was set up to be cash flow positive from day one. Yeah. So sort of a version of the Costco model where he he collected a, a membership fee uh, yep. from these small firms that he would put on his website, right? Very clever, very smart. And and yet I don't hear a lot of pe people in Japan were excited about Rakuten. They would say, yeah. well, we don't have Amazon. I say, you have Rakuten. Yeah, but it's not as good. And <laughs> I think it's pretty good, right? He, it's, he, great. it's pretty good. He's a multi-billionaire. It's not so bad. Yep. <laughs> Couldn't agree so more. there's that, right? So you, you, there's also this reputation. Also, Japan's Japanese society is a little bit tough on its entrepreneurs as well. Right? Yeah. 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 That. Yeah. Yeah. There is that. I mean, look, everyone wants to go home and introduce their intended spouse as being an employee of Itochu or uh, right. Bank of Japan or whatever else. No one yeah. wants to say they're working for Fusion Systems. <laughs> so, I get that. Oh. I get that. So, so uh, Eric has a fascinating question, which which I, I would like to convey to you. And so, and this I, the the context here, as I see it, is, um, you know, there's some liquidity now in the labor market in Japan, and lifetime employment is breaking open. We're going from the membership system to the job gutter system. Talent is scarce, so people who are really talented can probably shift jobs even if they're older than 40 right and to find a new employer so eric's sure. question is this what advice would you have for a mid-career japanese person to repurpose their opportunities learn english if they don't already know english so yeah. that's the key in my mind if they're already a, a relatively fluent not a native english speaker but business english the the opportunity horizon is very very broad um, and I think it is really rather binary. If they don't speak English, it is very, very difficult. And the labor market is relatively unfavorable towards some of those mid-career Japanese folks. So I think it is really critical. And you know, it, it sounds condescending coming from a native English speaker. I kind of hit the lottery by growing up in New York and learning how to speak at least New York English. Uh, and so whatever that it, is <laughs> it's, it's easy for me Some to version say of that. English <laughs> but going back to Rakuten uh, you know uh, Mikitani Shacho did mandate English as the language yep. and you're seeing more and more Japanese companies uh, creating a, a either TOEIC or TOEFL hurdle yep. for career advancement and so I think there's a general acknowledgement uh, yeah. It's also, okay. I think, easier to manage culture change. I heard from several companies that say we're going to do the board meetings in English because it's easier to criticize uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, whatever the company is doing in in English because in Japanese it gets so complicated and you have to do all the keigo and the, you know, the saltos and you know, yeah. sort of. But but in but in English you can just be much more direct, right? And so so that's also true. Although I heard uh, back to the small companies. Um, there, there are, you know, people have asked me, is it possible for a foreigner to start a, to launch a startup in, in Japan and about the language that you've mentioned now twice already, right? Uh, and, and what I see in some of the startup companies is that their common language is code or, or, or chemistry or biology or whatever the 
whatever the special the, the specialty is. And then they have a, a Japanese CEO who has, as you just mentioned, the charisma to go out and get the money and, yeah. and a bunch of foreign talent. And that it's not a, as much of a problem there, right? Because everybody brings something to the table and they can Absolutely. always speak in code. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I mean, that's one of the, if you want to call it a secret, secrets I've had here for 30 whatever years building companies is I don't care what language people speak. Um, I don't care if they speak no English and no Japanese, as long as they can write good software or uh, develop good software architecture or systems architecture or whatever it is. Uh, and so I, I do think the important point here is that small companies have the discretion to build their game plan around the talent instead of trying to force the talent into an existing game plan. And that makes all the difference in the world. So a good venture CEO will accommodate the talent. Because that's what really will ultimately drive success in the business. But in a large company, you're basically saying everyone needs to be treated equally. Fairly, of course, however, equally. And really, there's no startup I know that treats everyone equally. It's much more eclectic than that. Uh, and so I, I do think it's an important point. And again, I think it's an advantage for small companies uh, here or venture or startup companies to be able to say, yeah, when you can write C++ code as well as Ulrike, We'll treat you the same way we treat her. Yeah. So get to it. Get start studying uh, and, and start practicing. And I think that's well accepted in the venture world. Uh, again, people are treated relatively equally and fairly, but there are always outliers and you accommodate the talent. You just talent's what wins the game at the end of the day. And you've got to build your, your team and your game plan around that. So uh, uh, Padma just called me on something, and I, I want to bring this up because I think she, she, they uh, will uh, guiding us in, into an interesting direction. I said that Mickey Tani son made made a bill, made a, several billion dollars, and so hey, what's the not too shabby, right? Um, Padma is wondering whether we need to value success in business and billions or some numbers. And the reason I'm fascinated by that question is that I think that might actually be overdone in the United States, that that success, that Great. dollars is an easy metric, right? And so we celebrate the people that get rich and we don't celebrate the people that are maybe social innovators. But I'm wondering whether in Japan, there's still this social norm that you can't flaunt your wealth, you can't show off how well, how, how, how much money you made, and that that takes away a certain incentive that is that could actually be healthy. So how what, what is this what is a good definition of success for okay. somebody who's thinking about starting a company in yeah. Japan? That's a very subjective question. Yeah, sure. Um, but I agree that it's a, a question that deserves deep thought and introspection. So what I tell my daughter is you cannot help poor people by becoming one of them. So first build your personal platform so that you have the discretion to help the people that you feel you want to help. Now, for me personally, I think it's very important to have balance. It's, it's very easy for a, a startup CEO to become very narrowly focused on essentially chasing money all the time. You're chasing deals, you're chasing financing, you're chasing clients, chasing partnerships. And that's a very unhealthy persona. And so you mentioned before I'm uh, on the board and one of the founders of uh, Hope in Japan in the uh, Tokyo office. And you know we're an extreme poverty NPO. We do a lot of work in Cambodia, Ethiopia, and the Philippines around uh, community development, clean water, et cetera. And, Part of the reason I do that is to achieve that balance where you have an understanding that life's not all about bank accounts and aggregation of wealth or capital. It's about being an integral member of your community and being a net positive contributor to that community. So to the person who asked the question, Padma, I think it is important for entrepreneurs to understand themselves well enough so that they understand how to achieve that balance 
going forward. And I would never make a value judgment one way or the other. If somebody is very focused on aggregating billions, of, God bless them, that's great. In fact, I want to, <laughs> I'd like to sell them stuff if I could. Um, and hopefully they'll use some of that wealth and influence to benefit society. On the other hand, if people want to be essentially monastic and, and lead a very <laughs> Spartan existence, but do their best to contribute, to, that's great also. I think those are two poles on this continuum. And where we sit as individuals is something that that's a lifetime pursuit to me. And at different points in your life, you know, while you're building a family and growing a business, you might be a little bit more on one side of that. I think as your personal situation changes, I think it's perfectly reasonable to look maybe to move yourself elsewhere in that continuum. But I, I do agree. It's not about who has the most zeros on their bank book. That, that to me is a very um, crass or basic way of measuring oneself. It's more well, about- Sometimes I think though that, that Japanese startups would could be a little bit more greedy. Well, part of it is having stronger boards and yep. more demanding right. investors, frankly. Yep. That's right. Um, and That's so right. So because if you don't make a lot of profit, you will not attract a lot of venture capital investment. Your growth rate will be truncated and possibly a yes. So, so there, yes. there, there is some value to money, but- there is, and we, we've you know we've implemented some corporate governance reforms. Um, our friend Nick Benish has been driving that, uh, both from behind and in front of the scenes for decades, and and a lot of that's coming to fruition now. Uh, I think ultimately, it really benefits entrepreneurs to have good, strong, experienced board members uh, who have maybe been through it and understand some of these dynamics, and will push them in ways they may not have understood they needed to be pushed. So, um, so we have a bunch of questions on the larger region, and um, you operate. I mean, you know, when, whenever I'm lucky enough to catch you in Tokyo or on a plane to Singapore, or you're going to some place in Southeast Asia or China, or something, you know. So, um, so there are a number of questions here. One is um, whether the exchange rate will actually further the Japanese move. A Broad or investments, one way or another. Uh, William would like to know whether Japanese and U.S. venture capitalists are looking into investing in in, in, in Southeast Asia and Indonesia. So can you tell us a little bit about, especially for those of us who haven't been able to go to Asia in a long time because of the pandemic? What's the scuttlebutt on the Asian region in terms of business? Yeah, it, there's a lot of interesting things going on. I was just in Singapore, as you know. And it was really surprising to me how positively Japan is viewed from the Singapore perspective right now. So that's been, a, I hadn't traveled at all during COVID. It was just too difficult and too Mendoxai and, and all of that. Uh, but now that we can move around a little, it really surprised me uh, the appetite for Japan information market data on the ground market data that exists in Singapore. Uh, and so, I, you know, look, I don't know anything about exchange, right? I, I talked to our friend Jesper Cole when I need uh, macroeconomic information. Uh, I think high interest or, or movement in the interest rates benefits some companies, hurts other companies, drives certain industries, onshore, offshore, all of that stuff. I think one thing I can tell you is what I'm hearing from some Japanese CEOs is that the uncertainty geopolitically is creating discussions around onshoring or nearshoring or friendly shoring, however you want to phrase it, um, that I hadn't heard those discussions prior to this. So I can see that's a dynamic that may be, may be growing. Uh, I think there's a general perception in Asia that we, they are between uh, the US and China mm. and generally do not want to pick sides. They just want to do business essentially. And so threading that needle, I think is a, a policy discussion that's taking place throughout the region. Uh, and 
strangely, I don't think either China or the U.S. understands the, the countries in the region at all. And so they're both behaving in a very heavy handed fashion, which hopefully will be mitigated over the next few years. Uh, so my impression is that Japanese companies may understand the region quite well or are learning fast. There's a there's a lot of investment by Japan in in Indonesia, for instance, the banks, yes. uh, but also production sites and so forth, right? Japan's real good about about that. Um, I think what they're not real good about yet is relinquishing control to the local teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that would be a, a evolution in that dynamic, which I think would be beneficial. And as I said, J Japan has looked at quite positively in the region, broadly speaking. Um, and it's not just from a business perspective. I think Japanese culture, Japanese pop culture, you know, it, we don't have the Korean drama hit series yet, but, you know, Japanese pop music, Japanese fashions, Japanese food. Um, it's very interesting to walk around Singapore or Hong Kong and see all of the little food stands with Japanese names run by Singaporeans or Hong Kong people because it sounds cool and it sounds compelling and it has this perception of, of quality and value and all of this other stuff. So I think Japan is pretty well positioned in the region. And that is a result of some of what you're saying, Japanese companies being good global ambassadors, frankly. And in most markets, Japanese companies treat people better than any other <laughs> companies treat people in those markets. And uh, folks understand and appreciate that. So I'm looking at the clock and I could go on for hours as I yeah. always can with you, Mike, but, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but we don't have hours. So um, uh, my mentor, Hugh Patrick, has, has always uh, uh, has taught me that uh, you get great answers if you ask uh, what worries you most. And I'm, I've been doing this, uh, the regulars uh, on the Japan Zoom, you know, know that I do this, but, but the problem with that question is we end on, an, on a negative note. So I want to ask you, what worries you most and what do you think is the biggest opportunity for Japan for 2023? Mm. Obviously, I, I think what worries me most, and it's going to be the answer most people here would give, are geopolitical dynamics. And so Japan's a beautiful place. It's lovely. There's great quality of life. Everyone's prosperous, successful, literate, numerate, et cetera. The thing that could ruin that very quickly is some sort of armed conflict in the region. And so that's what worries me, and that's what keeps me up. Um, in terms of opportunities in Japan, I think Japan is probably the single most undermarketed asset on the planet. Um, <laughs> so I'm still waiting for the first person, first foreigner who visits Japan and doesn't love it. Everyone who comes here for the first time loves it. They love the food, they love the people, they love the, the mountains and the skiing and the beaches and the transportation and the cleanliness and the, the courteousness and everything about it. And so what excites me is seeing more and more foreigners come to Japan and then go back home and tell everyone how great it is here and how interesting and, and dynamic and exotic and pleasurable it is to be a visitor or a citizen in Japan as a foreigner. Uh, and I, I look forward to more young people from overseas coming to Japan to create their own businesses, communities, families, et cetera. Uh, and that's what would excite me going forward. And the opportunity is there, right? Because uh, Japan has changed the visa requirements. If you, if you are talented and young and energetic. We'll get you in. We'll get yeah. you in. Right. Absolutely. Um, uh, so, so, um, that takes us to the to the end of the hour, Mike. I have many, many more questions, but I wanted to leave the audience with the advice or the idea you gave me when I was writing the book and, and we talked and you said that that our colleague Jim Fallows had written a book about the United States and had said that um, if you if you look for, at the United States from afar, 
and it doesn't look so great, but as you get close to the ground and you go into the communities and the cities and the villages and whatnot, it's a it's a nice place. And um, and I, I think you had nicer words than that, but roughly that was the message. And you said that it was a little bit uh, in the reverse in Asia that, that people got all excited about China and from afar, uh, definitely China looks very exciting at the fast growth and it's so big and you know all of the opportunity. But as the plane descends, and you go closer to the ground in Asia, you realize that that that, that Japan actually looks pretty good. So, yep. um, so I wanted to close on that note, and I did it just on the you. hour. So uh, I'm <laughs> glad good. I made it into the book. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So thank you, Mike. Uh, it was great to have had you. Thank you, audience. And don't forget, we'll be back in two weeks from now, uh, talking about how the pandemic has changed policy making and policies uh, across Asia. So we'll have Eve here and that'll be uh, a, a great update on that. So thank you everybody. Uh, thank and you. with that, I'm going to push this button and end it all until next time. Thank you. Thank you.